Mm-hmm. Called this meeting to order. <laughs> hey. Everybody's awake. We are now. <laughs> Can't hear, but we're awake, Phil. Uh, this meeting of the RMLD Board of Commissioners is being videotaped at RMLD offices at 230 Ash Street, Rennie, Mass. The meeting is being videotaped for distribution to the community television stations in North Reading, Wilmington, and Linfield. I would like to add that I got a complaint from the North Reading selectmen that our meetings are not being brought, not being submitted, not getting up to the NORCAM uh, people in North Reading to be published, to be uh, broadcast up there on a timely basis. So I don't see anything we do about it. Uh, I don't know if it's if it's uh, something. I don't think it's, I don't think it's our fault. I think it may be RCTV not getting the information up to them timely. But this complaint I have gotten, I've heard back through the channels. Yeah. I, th I think we they on a DVD, we make copies and we have to get it up there. So I'll make sure that um, it's being delivered. Okay, uh, NORCAM complains that they're not getting the, the entire meeting either. They're getting snippets of it. So um, there's some sort of communication problem going on there. So I have, I've gotten that complaint back back at this time. So I just, just wanted to bring them up. Uh, let me read the code of conduct. The RMLD Board of Commissioners recognizes the importance of hearing public comment at the discretion of the chair on items on the official agenda as well as on items not on the official agenda. We ask that all questions and comments from the public be directed to the chair and that all parties, including members of the RMLD board and commissioners act in a professional and courteous manner when addressing the board or responding to comments. Once recognized by the chair, all persons addressing the board shall state their name and address prior to speaking. It is the role of the chair to maintain order on, in all, on all public comment and ensuing discussion. All right, very good. So, um, introductions. You're here tonight, Dennis. <laughs> yeah. Anyone want to add, add, anything to say? No, everything's good. Okay. We just did. I did want to mention that we uh, did that uh, solar tour, and you and I were both there, and um, it was actually an interesting tour. So that was okay. uh, nice. Good. Very um, good. All right. We had sun. <laughs> yeah, I mean, John is Mr. Stimpak is away and he's not here tonight. Uh, just to make that note, uh, so we got the citizen advisory, you know, any liaisons or any public any public uh, comment. We see nobody here, so let's move on to the citizen advisory. The uh, item five, which is the citizen advisory board tenants. I attended their last meeting. Uh, the meeting was mostly about the uh, the rate. Uh, in the rate uh, that we talked about, the rate adjustments that you have on the agenda later on tonight, uh, the Citizen Advisory Board did vote to recommend. Um, can't say they were particularly enthused. <laughs> I can't say they really wholeheartedly endorsed it, but uh, they did vote in fully in favor of it at this point. They were concerned about the cost that it's going to have. So, and that's really all that, all that I have under that. Uh, I'll go right to the, to the chair. Um, I want to make a public comment. I saw a sign out on Bash Street tonight that said, hate has no home here. And I totally, I totally endorse that and totally agree with that sign. I've seen several around towns and I just want to say that I totally agree with that. Um, a couple is. things we had, we had the uh, Wilmington solar uh, ribbon cutting uh, last week, last Thursday, went well. Um, you know, so that's up and running. Uh, we had a strategic session since our last meeting uh, in terms of where we had a lot of good discussion. We got a lot of assignments for uh, people to come back. Uh, we are looking to potentially have another meeting early in early July, be our next meeting. So, um, Tracy, you'll, you'll circulate some uh, dates so we can maybe get see when everybody's available to come back. Um, the other thing is, too, I don't know where we stand in the committee on the town, the uh, payment to the town of Reading. I don't know if you've heard whether people have been appointed to that or not at this point, or, or where we are on that at this point. So, because I'd like to have that, I'd like to call a meeting of that committee pretty soon too, at this point. So maybe the department can contact the town and see what the Reading selectmen have appointed anybody at this point, in terms of where that's going at this point. I don't know if, Dennis, you anybody been appointed on the CAB at this point? For um, Winfield? Yeah, or for, for, uh, for we the We have North Reading and Reading. Yeah, the two, the two members, the two membership, the two members of the uh, sub, on the subcommittee to look oh. at the payment of the town of Reading. Um, I believe um, George was going to um, okay. get involved, but I will double check with him. Okay, all right, very good. But I would like to get that committee going pretty soon at this point. Yeah. I'll mention it to him when I see him. All right, very good. Yeah. I'm sorry. So, was there an action item 
on for me I so think the action item is to contact the, the town manager's office see if, if the, what the, where they stand on appointing any members to that sub that committee that we had talked about from before is it a selectman committee or is it no it's it's basically a committee of two members of the board which is mr. Stempeck and myself okay. two members from the CAB and either one or two members of the Reading Selectman or designees, whoever they would like to have on that committee, to try to work on this thing and have some sort of report back for November. Dan Ensminger, he was here. Yeah, he was yeah, here. He was here. Yeah. He was here, but I don't yeah, know where they. He was supposed to check, I think. So I don't know where that. I haven't heard anything back as to okay, where that where that is at this point. Yeah, okay. Start with him and work with him. I just don't want to, you know, it's almost July. We get into July and August, and you know, yep, yep. something we, we should do pretty pretty soon. Okay. All right, Colleen, you're up. Okay, great. I just have a couple of announcements, and then we'll jump into the organizational study, and then Hamid's going to do the reliability study updates. Um, um, similar to previous years, customer service will be closed on Monday, July 3rd, and Tuesday, July 4th. Customers can still drop off the payments at the mailbox outside of RMLD and access to pay their bills online. Uh, RMLD held a ribbon cutting ceremony at the Community Solar at 326 Ballard Vale, as um, <coughs> Mr. just said, as, as well as um, Cab Number Dennis Kelly. Um, I, th I think it was a great event, as, as, you, as you've indicated. Uh, we do have a ribbon cutting coming up for our new uh, peak generator, but that date is to be determined. So I'll, I'll, I'll send out an email as soon as we're able to confirm that. In the community engagement area, um, shred the peak info table on the training, uh, Reading Lions Club Friends and Family Day, June 17th, Wilmington Farmer Market, June 25th, uh, info sessions at local senior centers, various dates in June. Um, Jane will those days in June to the website calendar. Uh, don't believe so. <coughs> them on yeah. a calendar that would be great sure and um, last but not least uh, you know they have, they've had a number of um, long meetings at, at the selectman meeting in North Reading so we haven't been able to, to get in our our last quarter selectman presentation in North Reading but that's now been um, scheduled for Monday June 19th so um, those are the <coughs> updates and Colin oh, yeah. Mr. Chief, <coughs> yeah so in May, I'm just looking to see if they're there, and I missed it. So, on those calendar dates, uh, we usually get them at the meeting. But is there? I wonder if there's a way to include them in maybe the board package or something. Just uh, you know, some will be ones we may want to attend as board members at or the ours. local senior centers. Yeah, just okay. one. You know, or things like when they're town day activities that RMLD is part of. Okay, Jane, what 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 do you wait for in order to nail down the day? Did you? For the local seats. Oh, so those dates have been selected. Oh, okay. So we're going, we've been to Reading and we're going to be attending um, Winfield and Wilmington. North Reading was not interested in hosting them. Okay, but do you have the dates? I don't have them with me, but they have been selected, so I can forward those to the commission as well as update them on the website. All right, great. Yeah. And isn't there a uh, not that I know that maybe there's nothing connected to RMLD for that, but isn't this weekend? Is this. Uh, Reading Town Day or something? Friends and family? Or it's something, isn't it? No, I thought for the town. I thought they usually have a something at uh, Bridge Meadow. I thought it was this weekend. You know, fireworks, fireworks, fireworks Saturday or something. Night. Yeah, Saturday. That is Saturday. Yeah, but that's the something that what precedes it is like a town day, isn't it? Usually, across from Birch Meadow is the town day. Yeah. 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 Anyway, I didn't know if there was anything connected for. I don't for think we're having any type of. Uh, these are ones that we do like shred the peak table yeah, yeah. information <coughs> tables and stuff um, okay yeah, it was north reading town day last sunday north reading yeah okay i'll see if i can so find. do we not plan on being at reading town day yeah we'll, we'll, we'll be there we'll have a table on as educational information on shred the peak i'm now confused <laughs> yeah, yeah i don't know reading town day no, it's Reading Friend and Family at oh, the first okay. day of school this Saturday. Oh. 
Okay, oh, so, sorry. Okay. Oh, okay, so we have, we have something during that. Correct. Oh, okay. So okay. it's the first one on the list that I read. Oh, mm -hmm. oh it's, I, it's I, just I said on the list. On the list, I don't have <laughs> the list you read. Yeah, yeah. I got it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Is there a full moon tonight? <laughs> well, the good news is together we have the whole story. <laughs> <laughs> so everybody's going to show up all the yes. time. Okay. Thank you, Colin. Very good. Yep. Go forward. So <laughs> okay. Um, so I'm just going to go through, everyone has seen this, we've done this a number of quarter updates, so um, I'm not going to go through each one. I'm just going to talk a little bit about the highlights. Uh, the strategic plan, right now we're gathering uh, this year information from um, the employees. We're having strategic meetings with the commission, <coughs> all the information together, and then the first quarter of next year we'll put together a report. Thank you. updated as part of the budget and that's an ongoing um, every year the electric system master plan has essentially been completed uh, by me and his group um, I think a final report he'll probably do a presentation in September or whatever to, to show you where we are with the, the grid modernization uh, and the entire roadmap so Workforce development plan is, is wrapping up. That means career development plans and rewritten job descriptions for everyone that works here. So uh, we're in the final stages of that. It's, it's been quite an undertaking. Um, a lot of the job descriptions have to go through the union. So it's, it's a, it's a time-consuming process, but we're wrapping that up. So that's, that's making great, great headway right, headway right there. Um, yep. Succession plannings are also uh, part of that um, as we've been redoing the job descriptions and anticipating uh, people who may be retiring within five years and making sure that the skill sets uh, have been broadened so that um, other people in the groups will have opportunities to move ahead um, in those type of things. <coughs> performance review process. The way I kind of did it was when we came in, because we were redoing all the job descriptions and we, and we were writing career development, we didn't have a review process for about a year and a half. But now that everything is done, we just have a new review process that we've just uh, finalized. Uh, all of the managers are sitting down with their employees and giving out the goals. And we start the process July 1st. So a year from now, uh, everyone will be reviewed in the, in the management union. Um, labor union doesn't have a review process, like a formal one. Uh, increased efforts to fill vacant positions. We just posted uh, three or four of the jobs this week. Um, we have a, a foreman, our line foreman is retiring, and so that's been posted up. We have a couple of uh, electrical engineering positions that are open that are posted. Have um, some IT positions that the union just, you know, looked at, gave us the nod on, so they'll be posting those up. So we seem to be moving along, uh, but again, it, it is quite an extensive process when when it has to go through such a, a rigorous review. Uh, Let's see. Um, just spoke about expanding the engineering group. With signing and uh, <coughs> IBEW contract now, the engineering group is now um, composed of five positions for system engineers that each person can go from wherever they've been assessed on their own merit up to system engineer. So you'll have five engineers that are all cross-trained uh, and capable of understanding it, the knowledge of the system and um, you know outage information, control authority, so we're very excited about that. So that was kind of wrapped up with this IBEW contract that you guys just signed uh, last last meeting. Let's see. Um, assess organizational culture and employee satisfaction. 
Um, I think I'm probably going to hear a lot of that when we do the review process that's coming up. So that's, uh, I think that's when we're going to get a lot of our input, and then a lot of that input will go into the strategic plan report. Go ahead. Yeah, so I, Colleen, I just want to go back and then come back to this one. So, uh, on the performance management review process, is that um, is that based on the calendar year of work? So, in other words, it, it, or some companies do it by fiscal year; they do it by anniversary yeah, of the July first. <coughs> okay. Yeah. And did you say that that excluded that the union pro was not included in that process? No, it is. It the, is the evaluation. Well, we have a formal evaluation pro process for the direct managers yep. that, that I've sent out copies and showed you how we yep. do that. Now yep. we have a review, pro we had a review process for the IBEW middle management, yep. okay? And we, we kind of put that on hold for about a, a year and a half or two cycles while we wrote all the job descriptions right. and the career developments. Because yep. otherwise it would have been okay, it wouldn't have started off as yep. a good evaluation right. because we got everyone. Yeah, yeah. Straight. Yeah. So that starts July 1st. Yeah. So all the managers have the templates now and they're working with their employees to get is it them started. Is it a paper based process? Is that what you. Um, or do you have a software? You're not using a software, are you? No. For the no. Review? Okay. Um, would you like to see a copy of it? No, 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 no. I was just okay. curious that when you mentioned I didn't know if it was <coughs> electronic or paper based, but it sounds like it's similar to what's used for management. On the. Um, on the culture piece, uh, I know Dave has some experience with it too. Not to suggest you do it now, but another way to address the uh, organizational culture and feedback is through a, a survey, employee survey, which uh, you know we can look at that offline and give some suggestions. You'll get right. you'll get some of that as you said in the performance yeah, review. Yeah, we, we have a, a, an employee survey that was part of what Lidos had suggested to do. Oh, okay. Um, we just wanted to finish the job descriptions, yeah. the career developments, so that everybody was aware, okay, here is your job description, here are your duties, yeah. here's your career development and your training, um, and then have all of the <coughs> uh, union contracts signed. Yeah. So once that's all done, now you can kind of get some feedback. Otherwise, right. you're getting feedback on something that it hasn't been completed yet. Right, yeah, you'll get a lot of feedback, falls. and I, I don't know what my job is, I don't have a job exactly. description. Yeah. Exactly. That's true. Thank you. Um, cross divisional management training is occurring, uh, and so is leadership training. Let's see. On five. We are having project management um, training come in here, and we're going to have either a one day course, or a two day course, or a three day course, depending on what level of project management. If you're not going to be assigned project management, but you have to work with someone, and be an administrator, uh, help to that, then you would take like the one day course. If you're expected to run a project like building a generator, soup to nuts, multidiscipline, you'd be in the three day course. Uh, we're just trying to get prices now to bring someone in so that we can train in house. We don't want to start sending people out, it would be too costly. So. Right. Uh, policies are, being, are ongoing, they're being updated. Um, risk management plan, uh, as far as power supply, we're, <coughs> we're looking at that now. That's an ongoing process. Formalized financial accounting business processes. Um, Wendy's been doing a great job. You've seen the changes that we've made in that, so that's moving along. Um, assign compliance manager and develop compliance plan and requirements. Um, that has not been done yet. We're trying to figure out the best way to address that. Um, so we're, the team will be meeting on that at the next staff meeting. Uh, we go to 11 now. Uh, 13, uh, asset management plan. We are, we are putting in um, a spry point is a automated quasi work order stock timesheet system that uh, a company out of Canada helped us build and that's an interim while we're reviewing, Wendy and everyone, we're reviewing a work order system, like a real work order system possibly out of Cogsdale or uh, the, one of the Harris systems that we use right now because they have never had a true work order system here which is best, uh, good business practice for a utility. 
So uh, right now we have this interim one that, that Wendy and I have been working on. <coughs> it's, it's being piloted right now with the troublemen in the control room operators and um, so that should go online within the next month or two and then we're expecting maybe by next year we'll have a recommendation for a work order system that will really help your day asset management your everything it's you know if anybody is familiar with the work order systems you know how um, they bring everything together um, Enhance current workplace. Uh, I'm, I'd like to be able to bring everyone around for a tour maybe <coughs> in September. You can kind of peek at some of the offices. They've been painted, reorganized, and desk layouts for more efficiency. People have been moved uh, in different places so that there's better communication. So I think by September, that would be a good time to go around and look at the physical layouts. Um, Paul McGonagall and facilities has done an excellent job. Nice. That's all I have on organizational update. Any questions? Uh, and I think it's a good, uh, good progress. Uh, mm -hmm. It's nice to see the tracking because there's a lot of stuff that we went over a couple of years ago, and yeah. now so it's nice, uh, nice to see that there's good progress being made. Yeah. Okay. Any other comments? Okay. Yeah, I do. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, I have a question. Um, the leadership development for the management team, right. is that already in process? Have you had training sessions, or is it about, how's that, what does it look like, I guess, is the question. Well, there's a couple of levels of leadership. There's your middle management leadership, and so that project management and supervisory skills and responsibilities, conflict of, um, not conflict of interest, but conflict employee resolution and things mm -hmm. of those, those have been put on <coughs> everyone's career development. And so we're trying to bring, a lot of people have taken the classes in the last six months, but we're trying to bring in trainers to try to get more people done at the same time. Um, on the direct report level, we have a, another level of management training that we're trying to put together now um, under their career development plans. Um, and you know, so some of that I think we've discussed in executive sessions, so it's still kind of draft on that one. But okay. But the middle management is, they know what they have to take. And it's just a matter of uh, consolidating to, to save money. Maybe we can do 10 people at a time. And that also includes leadership <coughs> in unions, uh, the labor unions, like mm -hmm. lead linemen, lead technicians, <coughs> and any um, supervisors and that as well. They're all required to take the leadership courses too. Great, thanks. Any other questions? Comments from the board? Um, on the work order system, you said you, know, you don't have one now. How have you been tracking work orders and labor and cost? Very difficultly. They have a stock sheet, a paper stock sheet. I don't know. That basically <laughs> you just, they would write down what they were working on, what inventory they've taken out, what inventory they've put up, the time for the day for anyone themselves or their assigned crew. Um, and, and that's it, and it's been paper. And it, it comes in, it gets reviewed by the general foreman, uh, and then it was getting hand walked to six different places. So how are you doing inventory management out of that? Someone was going in and deducting what someone used everything in a spreadsheet, being, or how? Everything was being done manually, that's correct. Mm -hmm. And so SpryPoint um, came in and they helped us so the stock sheet has become automated, but it's become integrated. So now when you're filling it out, you're capturing your GIS facility ID points. Uh, your time cards are drop down boxes. Uh, your inventory will go right into inventory. So when we get the asset management system, it will integrate in. <coughs> we have a drop down box for customer action notifications. That now it means that right on the tablet, if you go out and you leave rubber, rubber up somebody's service because they're going to paint their house, right away, as soon as you fill that out and you get the customer to sign it, you hit send and the email goes to the wire inspector in here so we know that that person has some of our assets. If, you need, um, if the person needs an electrician, we would say, you need to get an electrician. And you can come back a week later and they didn't get one and, and now something's smoking. So right away, as soon as they need an electrician, they have to sign email goes out to the wire inspector and to us so we can follow up. Um, there's a drop down box for police details so we can capture all of, all of those requests in time. Um, 
So it's, it, it's quite a work of art that got put together and it's on tablets. Each truck has a tablet, but right now we're, we're piloting with the trouble men and um, the control room. Because what we want the, the control room to do is when trouble comes in, instead of writing it down on a slip <coughs> or calling the person on the phone, you call up a trouble ticket, you fill it out, you get the customer's phone number or uh, email if we don't have it, so that helps with our database, and then it gets sent to the troubleman's inbox. So if he's up in the bucket and he's yeah. in a dangerous situation, he doesn't want a phone going off. You wait down, you get into your truck, you open my work orders. And then you can prioritize them too, because you're not, if you got three in Wilmington, you can stay in Wilmington instead of driving the truck from here, over to here, over to here. So there's a lot of efficiency built in. So once that pilot is done, then we'll, we're gonna roll it out to everybody else uh, to start using, and then we're gonna get rid of the paper stock sheets. So essentially it's a work order system, and then the work order system that's part of the Harris system is even more integrated, because then we'll be able to be integrated into the, GI, uh, <coughs> the GIS and the outage management system, and it, it will become a, a more of a standardized utility work order practice. But yeah, I, exactly. There wasn't one. Okay. It's amazing. <laughs> but we're fixing it. Yep. But it's a long process. Thank you. And a big change for everybody. So yeah. more change. I've been involved in four inf five implementations of work order systems for manufacturing and different things that help manage inventory. And um, the change in getting it implemented is where the trouble comes in because um, it's a completely different way of doing and thinking. So getting people to adapt to it is usually the hardest part, especially when they use the paper. Yeah. Right. Well, and, and even harder is that if you had a work order system before and you knew why you needed all the information of where it was going to, and you had that big <coughs> picture, maybe if you were just upgrading it, the change, this is even harder than that because they weren't collecting enough data that needed to go where it needed to go. You know what I mean? So yep. it's kind of a double whammy. Right. But we're doing it. I mean, it's, it's coming along. Further questions or comments? I mean, the reliability, thank you so much. Uh, what you have in front of you are four pages of the recommendations that made by a uh, consultant uh, that we brought in uh, two years ago to do the organizational and reliability study, Booth and Associates, if you recall. So on pages one and two, these are the recommendations made by them. And on pages three and four, you see the recommendations made by UPG, that's the contractor who uh, did the testing at the, all the substations and we found some uh, problem, uh, enormous problems, uh, maintenance related problems that we needed to fix. So, uh, and the, the booth recommendations, you know, we're making good progress. Uh, and uh, I'm glad to uh, announce that, you know, finally the bus work at station five is completed. You know, that substation is old, has reached its, uh, the end of its useful life. So we are looking for land in order to build a new substations in Wilmington area, Ballotvale uh, Street, basically. <coughs> so, but we need to get this substation going until we find it uh, land. So we're talking about three to five years uh, in order to get this project completed. In the meantime, we needed to uh, do some upgrades and, you know, rejuvenate the bus work at uh, the switch gear. So as we were uh, making repairs and we're making reinstalling the bus, we found out asbestos that we had to kind of, it kind of prolong the project. So we had to now put the operation to halt, uh, remediate the asbestos and then get back in and do the reinstallation, you know, reinstallating more. So that is finally done, completed. So uh, I feel good about it because, you know, that switch gears uh, life has been extended, uh, I would say, for another five to ten years. So that's going to give us enough time to build a new substation and, you know, get that done, hopefully uh, transfer everything to the new substation. So that is completed. The rest of them, we've got some others that are in progress, that's like GIS, you know, the data collection is underway, and the data collection actually is completed. We are checking uh, the, their work, the con contractors' work, uh, DRGs, and uh, after, it's supposed to be completed by September 1st, 
and then we're going to push that into Millsoft model, engineering model, so we can uh, do our engineering analysis with more accuracy. Uh, right now we have a model that we just made a temporary model, and that's how we do our engineering analysis to make sure everything is uh, safe, sound, and secure. So that's being done. Uh, and some of the SCADA work that it's underway right now, we got consultants still actually this week from uh, Schweitzer and uh, uh, surveillance that they are in and they are upgrading the SCADA as well as programming the substation three, substation four, so we can get telemetry data, all of those substations, as well as connecting the station three, station four to Eversource and national grid. So uh, we could join the overall 115 KV network work and operating uh, the breakers uh, in coordination with the RAMVEC or soon we're gonna be converting to convex to Eversource. So uh, it, it's going really good. I'm glad about the progress that we are making. So that's pages one and two, you see, and uh, pages three and four, all the critical items that were identified as a result of testing every piece of equipment at the substations by UPG, uh, they're all completed. We got minor issues that we're dealing with, they're in progress, but the major ones, they're all completed. Uh, the uh, <coughs> power we just had in Wilmington, that was part of substation five and the upgrades, right? Yeah, the upgrades of what? Of was, was that part of the settings and upgrades at um, substation five? Substation five was the bus. The bus is old. The bus installation was uh, actually gone. It was tracking. And that should have been, you know, taken care of four or five years ago. Unfortunately, you know, when we got to that and, you know, when I saw that three years ago when I came in, I saw that some tracking uh, which was dangerous and that uh, prompted us to test the switch gear and considering the age so we needed to open up open everything up to see what's going on behind there why it's tracking and while we started troubleshooting we found out that there are some problems with the bus and they got I, that i don't think that was the question right no, you, no. but as part of the upgrades <coughs> yeah weren't there no it wasn't because of the upgrades He's asking about, Dennis is asking about the outage the other night where the, the drawing setting didn't match the relay. Oh, the, I'm sorry. I got, I'm sorry. I got, I thought you were talking about Wasn't that, that substation five? That was a station five. Yes. That was the relay issue that, you know, uh, what the setting was set wrong. The, the CT was wrong. And that's why it didn't come back up that's why it didn't come back up then then what we did we did some switching and then <laughs> it brought everything back in but the, is, can I say Go ahead. but that's that wasn't a new setting it, it wasn't that wasn't like um, <coughs> um, that was an old setting that's an old setting which was, was we, that wasn't part of an upgrade right the CT wasn't part of the upgrade the CT uh, was set to it was it was wrongly identified as 1200 to 5 as a while it was 600 to 5. So the ground pickup of the relay right then being you know uh, 240 it was actually down to 120. Yep. So 120 amps you know that picked up and dropped the load and it they patrolled the line there were no problems with the line so we isolated switched off and then now it's fixed. So we brought it up. That was a mistake on the print. And uh, Thank you. No, go ahead. I mean, you said a term I wasn't familiar with, tracking. What did, when you yeah. were talking about tracking, what does that mean? Well, the tracking is whenever that, you know, where the energized uh, electrical equipment is uh, tracking to ground, if it's too close, you know, there should be certain distance. So okay. the air is acting as an insulator. So when that distance is short and, you know, well, the, the, in the switch gear, everything's so com compact. So the bus is so close to, to the uh, metal, metal clad, the metal uh, portion of the switch. So what happens when the insulation wears off, it starts tracking. Okay. So when it starts tracking, you see black dots, black spots on the side of the switch gear, and that's a sign of trouble. That means that, you know, well, <coughs> it could go at any given moment. And uh, that's what prompted us to do that repair. And it's it repaired. It's fixed now. It's safe. Thanks. Any other questions? Good, good uh, progress. Yeah. Lots of good yeah, projects. Yeah, good. We're making good progress in those. Yeah, yeah. Good. Thank you.
on any comments or questions? Nope. Nope. Yeah, we can move on to the uh, power supply report. Okay. Yep. Yep, that's fine. Come on right up, Mayhew. <laughs> I know, we know we all, we all know you, but can you identify yourself and who you are? Yes, good evening. I, I'm uh, Mayhew Seavey. I'm with the firm of Powerline Models, PLM, in Hopkinton, Massachusetts. Go ahead. <laughs> Welcome. I'm here to make the final recommendations uh, for uh, rates for fiscal 18. I think you have the the, the best and final uh, presentation uh, in front of you. I'll try to see if I can. Oh, beautiful, brilliant. Uh, so I've listed here the, uh, the objectives that we uh, set out to, uh, uh, to accomplish with the rate design this time. These are, th this is in addition, of course, to uh, uh, producing sufficient revenue to uh, cover all of the expenses and, and, uh, and, and capital requirements of the, the department. So the, the baseline rate design was to uh, essentially uh, increase revenues to the level that would produce the, the required rate of return. Within that, we wanted to address some other issues uh, in the rate design itself. And they included uh, reducing or eliminating subsidies between and within classes of customer. This is something that <clears throat> we spent quite a bit of time talking about. Uh, we want to wanted to ensure that the rates for large, high load factor customers, the so-called good customers, can attract, uh, uh, continue to attract and retain such customers. We want to be sure that the rates are reflecting the cost of providing service uh, for some of the types uh, of expenses that you have, such as capacity and transmission, which have changed significantly over the years, uh, the, the rates are no longer uh, reflecting the, the proper price signal. And uh, we want to, again, provide price signals to encourage customers to reduce demand during peak periods and increase usage during off-peak periods. Uh, this, ben this should be beneficial to the customer. It should be also beneficial to the non-participating customers because it will reduce your, your, your total costs uh, and, and therefore prevent you having to increase rates still further. Uh, we're looking to phase in some of these changes over a period of time to permit the customers time to adjust in response to the new price signals that they're being given. And, and finally, we wanted, to do, we wanted to do something to protect distribution revenues from erosion Due, due to customer-owned generation, uh, specifically at this time, solar generation, but there's also some concern about other types of generation that customers could install and, and uh, battery storage as well. The, uh, the phase-in that we're, that we're proposing here uh, moves beyond a, a simple across-the-board increase in the distribution rates and, and adjusts the, uh, the rates for residential, commercial, industrial customers in such a way as to move them towards more uniform rates of return. Uh, the residential rate of return should uh, be increased up to zero, uh, which right now is, is significantly negative over that five-year period. At the same time, the, the commercial rate of return should be reduced from uh, high double digits down to uh, hopefully low double digits. And in, in the industrial rate, it, it will remain right about, uh, right about where it's at now because the industrial rate of return is, is, is quite low and appropriate for customers in that size. The, the first column of uh, numbers is the percent increase that customers would have seen if we simply went for a, 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 an across-the-board increase in distribution rates uh, that sufficient to, to cover expenses and produce the, uh, the target 8% rate of return. The reason that those vary 
is is that the the main reason that rates need to increase as much as they do has nothing to do with your distribution rates. Uh, it has to do with uh, capacity and transmission costs increasing significantly. And uh, capacity and transmission costs make up a, a much larger percentage of uh, commercial and industrial rates, total rates, than they do of residential rates. Uh, re residential customers pay a fairly high distribution charge. Uh, and so their total bill has less, uh, has less capacity and transmission in it. So, so you'd see that, uh, that commercial and industrial rates would, with an across the board increase in, in distribution rates, would increase less than the commercial, industrial, residentials would. What, we've, what we're doing in this is the first year of a, of a five-year phase-in of the adjustment, increasing the residential rates, reducing the commercial rates, keeping the industrial rates about the same. So that you can see that the residential increase, instead of being 5.6, is 6.6%, while the commercial rate, instead of being an increase of 5.7%, is only 3.5%. Uh, there will be similar uh, changes each year, although we will come back each year and revisit them because uh, a large part of this that's relatively unpredictable and beyond our control are those capacity and transmission costs. So uh, we'll, have to, we'll, we'll have to revisit those and, and l take another look at the, at the five-year phase in. Uh, the graph here shows, uh, shows those percentage changes uh, ov over five years based on the projections that we have today, uh, what we expect in terms of increases in your own operating and maintenance costs, and, and also the expected changes in capacity and transmission and purchased energy costs. Uh, and, and you can see that the, that the commercial uh, increases are less each year than the residential uh, and the and the industrial are, uh, are are quite a bit less than residential and then quite a bit more in fiscal 22 and and and, and that's a a big increase in uh, in capacity and transmission costs that take place at that time that drowns out the uh, the relatively small increase in distribution costs but the the important thing to see here is that is that while we have while we're having some fairly sig significant increases in fiscal 18 we're mostly looking at decreases in the 3 years after that uh, because capacity costs are trending back down again after fiscal 18 and and we don't actually know what capacity costs are going to be in fiscal 22 because that auction hasn't taken place yet so we'll have a better idea when that time comes the uh, oh, you're doing it great. <laughs> Thanks, I appreciate that. Uh, this shows shows a breakdown of uh, of a of a typical 750 kilowatt hour residential bill into the uh, base rate or, or di distribution cost, the the en energy fuel or fuel adjustment and purchase power, and you can clearly see how the the base rate. In, in the case of the residential rate, is increasing uh, pretty steadily, uh, a, a few percent each year. Uh, while some of the other costs, like the purchase power, uh, spiking up in, in, in 18 and then going down in 20 and 21. Uh, so again, the net effect is that in fiscal 18, you have an increase, and then things are pretty flat uh, for the next three years. So we're really looking at four years of of pretty moderate uh, rate change, uh, pretty much flat uh, rates. And, and the same thing on the commercial. Uh, the, the commercials actually show s some decrease in fiscal 20 and 21 uh, because their uh, base rate increases are very small. And when the capacity and transmission costs go down, in, in actually just capacity costs, then they'll actually see some some slight decreases. By the end of that period of time, you'll you'll have rates that are much more uniform, uh, much more quote unquote fair uh, to the different classes of customer. 
and and still quite uh, still quite competitive and attractive, particularly for the uh, the commercial and, and large industrial customers. And 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 finally, uh, the industrial uh, shows shows actually a, a pretty sizable decreases after after the, the next year. Uh, in eight, in 1920 and 21, uh, be, again because of those capacity costs going down, and and because capacity and transmissions is, is just a much bigger portion of of the industrial customers' bill. Now they pay very little in cents per kilowatt hour terms for their uh, base rate usage, their their distribution usage, because they're large users. They have high load factor and and they're using the power very efficiently. The, uh, uh, another recommendation having to do with getting the price signals correct is that we're looking to phase in a purchase power capacity and transmission demand charge. In the past, all of those costs have been recovered through an energy charge. As we pointed out in a previous presentation, that tends to uh, uh, be a, a, a subsidization of uh, poor load factor customers by good high load factor customers. And by charging the, the correct price signal for demand, uh, we remedy that situation and, and provide some rate relief to, to customers who use their demand a lot. And, and, and that's what you want to do. Uh, this will have an impact because it will be increasing rates to customers with poor load factors. Uh, but if we phase it in over three years, the impact can be minimized. And in fact, uh, only one customer in the first year is going to see an increase of more than 10%. And with the decreases that we saw in the previous slide, in, in the years following that, uh, there shouldn't be any customer seeing an increase, even, even with the additional phase-ins of, of the demand. So this is a pretty, uh, as painless a way of, of doing a, a significant shift of revenue from energy to demand charges as you can as you can accomplish uh, we, we also took a look at the re renewable generation rate the uh, the, the so-called net metering rate and, and and the finding that we came up with was that while there is a subsidization going on uh, it's it's relatively small right now it's it's in the vicinity of I think it was fifteen or twenty thousand dollars a year uh, for the existing 80 customers and and that it seemed reasonable to rather than putting a cap on the total amount of solar in, installed on the system as the private utilities have done uh, because they were required to by regulation that uh, that instead to cap the the total amount of subsidy at a level that while it's while it's significant, $100,000 a year, still only reps, represents a cost to an average residential customer of 11 cents a month. So uh, it it gives us time to develop a response uh, that that will not be perceived as discouraging renewable energy development. Uh, that it, it won't do any harm to existing customers who have made investment in facilities, uh, and and. It, uh, it 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 it's a good it's a good way to uh, to to provide some protection for revenues at a level when it if it becomes significant uh, and and I think this will probably buy you quite a bit of time uh, to to keep an eye on development. We are immediately recommending to put in place a backup and standby rate uh, to to protect against customers installing larger amounts of generation, uh, particularly non-renewable generation like backup and standby generators or cogeneration systems, combined heat and power systems. So uh, we've, we've got a, a, a proposed rate like that that's going into, pl into place. Sure, go ahead. Um, May, I just, I just would like you to clarify um, this charge, you know, to protect us, I just want the customers to understand what that means. It's to protect everyone 
because we still have to pay for distribution charges. We still have to keep the system up and running. That's right. Uh, uh, I just want you to clarify yes. that so that it, it doesn't it doesn't seem like it, we're trying to penalize people for putting in solar. Or, you know, there's no penalty for that. No. We just have to recover as a municipal our production charges, and we still have to have the electric system up and running and maintained. Yes. The, the important part, the important thing is to make sure that 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 everybody who uses the distribution system supports it uh, appropriately, uh, and and when a customer. Uh, you know, installs generation behind their meter, they're, they're, they're paying less and they're continuing to use the distribution system just as much. So it, it, it continues to recover, the idea is to continue to recover uh, the, the revenues to, to can maintain, own, and operate the distribution system because if you don't, uh, the rates will have to rise for everybody. Uh, Either that or you don't earn enough money to cover your expenses and continue to maintain the system. Uh, you know, there's no indication that you're, that you're in danger of any sort of catastrophic revenue loss at this point. It, it, it's more important to establish some precedents here, it, particularly in the form of, of the backup and standby rate, where we have this on the books that, uh, th that we have this rate so that if, if customers begin to look at uh, generating all or a significant portion of their own electricity through whatever means, they won't make a bad decision thinking that they can get away with not paying for any of the distribution system. The, the backup and standby rate makes it clear that you will pay for, to have the distribution system out there when and if you need it, whether or not you're using it today. Kevin, that uh, makes sense? We, we get it, yeah. So what, uh, what if somebody decided to just disconnect from RMOZ, would they still have that ability to do that? Yes, they, they can always do that. And, and that's a, it's a very risky thing to do, but they, you know, it's, it's, a, it's their responsibility. Mr. Chairman, I have one, one question. Yeah, you said would be safe, that cap of 100,000 would be safe for a few years. What do you estimate? How many years would it take to get up to that cap, the way trends are going with uh, um, people What's the, what, what's been the number of New residential it's solar installations. Total, it's been about 20, 20 to 20, 20 to 30 installations per year. Mm -hmm. So um, it's not going to be a driving force. So how many would we need? 300? About 300? Uh, yeah, so at the present rate, that would be 10 years. Uh, okay. You're, you're essentially, and, and there may be, you may reach a tipping point in the economics of these where all of a sudden it becomes a no-brainer to install them, in which case those 300 could, could happen overnight. So uh, that's why I'm, I'm, I'm sure you, you, the people here will notice that long before it becomes a problem because people will be coming in and getting permits. And Only um, um, uh, what is the amount of the standby rate that we're contemplating? And this is just a recommendation at this point also. Well, the backup and standby rate is, is, is is actually going I think that's being filed yes and so the the backup and standby charge is the present distribution rate times the amount of capacity that the customer wants you to back up so if they install a two megawatt generator uh, they're going to pay 2,000 kilowatts times however many dollars per kilowatt the present distribution rate is. So the, the idea is that they're going to continue to pay the distribution rate whether or not they run the generator, uh, they, but they'll still be able to avoid purchase power and capacity and, and, and fuel charge. So, and, but those are expenses that you, that you avoid. So you don't lose money if, if a customer buys fewer kilowatt hours from you, you purchase fewer kilowatt hours. So it it, and to be it, clear, we're not voting Washington. on this tonight, though. This is a recommendation that's being presented to us. We're not voting on a backup of standby rate tonight. No, we, we are. Yes. We are. I thought we haven't reached the. Uh, we haven't reached this cap yet. Oh, this is separate from the renewable energy cap. This is a, a, a backup and standby rate for uh, large customers who are who are in installing large generators. Uh, it, it doesn't apply to solar installations. Who's it affecting 
right now? Who will it affect right now? No, nobody. It, the intent is to have it on the books, uh, essentially as, if you will, as a deterrent to customers in, installing, you know, combined heat and power systems uh, or uh, solar projects that are larger than they actually need. Because uh, it's Matt, continue, Matt. Keep going, keep going. how many municipals have backup and standby rates on the books now? Uh, m most of the municipals that, that I do rate design for have one. Uh, it's, it's, example, it's, it's about half. Okay. Like which ones? Just curious. Oh, uh, Mansfield, Middleborough, Hudson, uh, Littleton. Uh, We're just following in the footsteps of our municipal siblings. Wellesley, Con Concord. Is modeled after those. What? May I? Go ahead. Yeah. I mean, there, there's a strategy to yeah, this yeah. entire thing. And, and when I came, the first thing we did was unbundle because we knew this was coming. And so you separate the whole bundle out so that you, you go through each charge and then people can see. So as they start to put solar on or, and as May you said, so I asked them to clarify that. If, if large customers are, are producing all of this power, we still have to pay for a distribution system in this. Of course. Just, this is just, you, you, wouldn't, just you wouldn't wait until all of a sudden we're being hurt and, and right. all the other Understood. customers have to have a rate increase. That's why we're I totally it understand. Down. I'm only asking how many other municipals have this and now I have the answer. That's all. Uh, I'd say about half. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Thank you. So in the residential time of use rate, we, we looked at this, we came up with a, uh, with a, a, a suggestion for uh, making it work better and, and, and we're not proposing to implement that at, at the present time because I think there are problems with implementing it through the billing system. Uh, the, the idea was to, was to the, presently the time of use is in the distribution rate, in the base rate, and, and there's no time varying component in distribution charges. It should be in the purchase capacity and transmission charge where you have the on and the off peak component. Uh, so we'll address that at, at some point in the future, but at, at the present time, uh, we just uh, made a, how, how did the, uh, what do we do with the time? use? It's, we would basically increase the on and the off peak uh, across the board. So that's left for the next time. The time of use people won't get dinged as hard this this year. Um, or they will. The what well, the, the time of line? use the time of use rate is the is one that's that that's looking at a higher a higher increase because it's uh, because of. Uh, it's it's too low. I understand what you said. So but, it's but, it's but this new wrinkle. May I? Go ahead. This Go ahead. new wrinkle that you've just described means that the rate increase that we're doing tonight is not going to be as high as we thought it would be for the. It it, it will be. It, it will. It, it'll just be. Uh, way. It'll just be in the. In a, in the time of use base rate, rather than going to a flat rate and increasing that, the the increase is the amount of the increase is the same as it would have been. And the, the last thing that we took a look at, look at was the electric vehicle rate. Uh, we had created a, a pilot rate in 2014 uh, that was designed around uh, three charging stations at, uh, at Analog. And it was based on some estimates of usage and, and the cost of installing those particular facilities. We took a look at, at, at how that's been working, at the cost of, of at how, how the cost of those charging stations has changed and we we there there was not enough usage data in particular to really be conclusive as to whether the the existing rate uh, is is adequate too high or too low so we're proposing to to uh, put a rate in place that reflects the the usage patterns that we've that we've seen at analog uh, and the costs for new charge stations that we've been quoted uh, and we've 
essentially increase the usage estimates because uh, if we use the actual usage, the actual kilowatt hours that uh, people were using at analog, uh, the rate would have needed to have been quite a bit higher uh, because uh, th they're not being used as much as we expected. So the, the rate that we're proposing is, is, is roughly equivalent to the rate uh, that, that's the, that was the pilot rate. And we recommend that that go into place and that we monitor the usage of, of new charging stations as they go in to see whether there's any need to adjust that going forward. You're always, with an electric vehicle rate, you, you don't want to have, raise it too high because then nobody will use it and it becomes the equivalent of, of the death spiral. Uh, you have to keep raising the rates. So, May I ask a question sure, about the electric? As, a, as an owner of an electric vehicle, um, I have some experience with what it, when I use charging stations and where. So are you saying the, the rate is set to how much we're paying for the installation of the chargers, not just what the electricity is costing? Well, yes, the, the rate is designed to recover the cost of the charging station. Okay. Uh, because, because otherwise that cost would be borne by, the, by all the rest of the rate payers. Right. So... And the location of the charging station is going to dictate both how much it costs to put in and how much gets used. Yes. So where are they? Where are we proposing to put them in? We're proposing to put some in right here at the RMLB. Bring two, I believe, in here. And where else? Well, we're go we have grant money, so it's supposed to be one, one per town uh, over the next four, four years. And the reason why there's two here is because one is the grant and one is because we're replacing one of our vehicles right. when it's time to replace it we're with an electric vehicle. vehicle. So we'll so have a, a dual charging station that we can charge our car and then Got someone can, else can use it. So go ahead, keep going. Um, I, don't, if some, I don't see anybody driving to the RMLD parking lot and, and running their credit card and sitting here for a half an hour. Uh, which would be the fastest it could possibly be to be useful. It just I don't really see that as something that will happen. I would never do it. Um, I have a, a trickle charge overnight at my house, and there's free chargers here and there. The way it works is when they're set at a place where people are going to go anyway, like a shopping mall. Uh, Work. Where their job, um, a downtown area, where when it's charging, they have something they can go and do. So I would just give just some feedback that when we think about citing them, paying a lot of money to cite them here um, for the public isn't, it may not work out the way we think it will work. Um, but the, for our stuff, you can, anywhere where there's a 240 volt dryer type outlet, you can just put for 600 bucks, you can get a 6.6 .6 kilowatt charger, which is what you're contemplating putting in anyway, and just plug it into the dryer outlet. So that could happen in a garage here right now for nothing. So for our internal uses, we don't need to spend a lot of money on it. Well, as Dave had indicated, one of the places where you install it is at work. So we were trying to encourage employees employees to to get an electric vehicle um, as they start to turn well, over their the, okay. next cars. Sure. And we can't have everyone plugging into a, you know, a company vehicle dryer. Okay. Got it. I was thinking of it as a public Thing right. that and you that, that's one of the things I see, and you know, when I park in the public in the garages downtown, right, you see they've got you know charges in a lot of these yep. now parking garages. Okay, I see what you mean. So they, you know, when it's viewed that way, then I, I retract my earlier <laughs> comments. No, but it is a good comment, though. I mean, you know, it'd be nice if they could have one, maybe in one of the public, you know, uh, parking areas here in each of the towns. Right, like in the in the downtown. In the downtown. Right, area. in the parking lot downtown. The, you know, the parking behind lot the behind shops. The, the main street. That or, would be a great or at a school, place. for example. Or at a school, a school yep. parking well, lot. Well, it's going to be one per town, and we'll work with the town as to right. where the best. Yep. Right where the best place is. Right. Okay. That sounds good. Well, hopefully we can do more than one. I mean, I mean if, if the concept is put them where there's employees parking all day, that's a good concept. And then it seems to me like we should be going for scale um, as, because I think we're going to see scale. Well, in, in, in our strategic meeting, if we look at the that electric vehicle like Braintree does that you, 
you know, charging stations at people's homes and things like that, and you get into that type of business, then you, they even have an electric vehicle leasing program, correct? Right. Um, so they're, they are really engaging yeah. in the community to bring in electric vehicles and, and putting in charging stations. So um, it's a, yeah, it's it great to be doing. We can't put in more, but we're. I don't, we're not going to build them and see if they come. We, they're going to have to come and rebuild them because exactly. we have so many other things to spend exactly. money on. So. And the other only other thing is, what are we going to do when they people haven't plugged in and it's the afternoon and it's our peak and we got 300 electric cars charging and we're charging 11 cents an hour a kilowatt. They can't, um, be, they can't be programmed. Yeah, right? they can be programmed. That programmed. Means they would either shut them off or reduce the amount of demand that would yeah. allow to be drawn. That's that's for those days we think might be peak days Correct. and people will be told be warned if it's 98 degrees out well thanks it's great yep. Yep. Right, I, I have a procedural question yep. this is come this is coming forward this now this has not gone to the CAB I need to know why this was not put not brought in time to the CAB what wasn't this is not the gone in front of the CAB, the electric, the electrical char yeah. vehicle charging rate. That's true. They do not have a, the CAB does not have a vote on this. So if we approve this tonight, it's going to have to be contingent on going back to the CAB and getting their approval. And I'd like an explanation why this now and not, not why it was not brought to the CAB. It was an oversight. I'll take the for that. Okay. We were focusing on those. The other one was just one slip through the cracks. So we ask that we put it on your agenda so that it could be effective. July 1st, um, contingent on it being approved at the June 21st CAB. Okay. All right. I, I, I will express the opinion that I'm not happy that this is coming before us and didn't get to the CAB first. Let me express that concern. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, go ahead, Mr. Commissioner. Uh, so, since Dennis is here, uh, how, what's your perspective? Uh, not that you make the decision for the cab totally, Dennis, but in terms of uh, in, any guidance that you would suggest? Well, this is the first time I've seen it and yeah. had to actually start trying to process it. Yeah. So Dave's had a lot of good input to like make me think about things. Yeah. So I, I think I like a little more detail, and I think the other members of our board are going to want a little more detail to understand the fees and the rates and how it's all going to work. I mean, Dave, being an electric car owner, obviously it yeah. is one-to-one -to, -one to him where it's not going to be too the uh, CAB so um, no we've had a few times where I think you know Phil brought up a good point that the data we had wasn't the same as what you guys may know maybe not the same but maybe we didn't have it all and we've, we've mentioned it a few times so getting something like this in in the meetings would have been good when we we're all there but you know we do meet next week um, and you know again I don't know how much knowledge the rest of the group will have with electric cars I don't think any of them own an electric car so um, getting a little more detail on it we could probably make a educated decision then but um, like maybe, sorry. well maybe it's worth um, can we defer this rate tonight um, and do the rest of it because I mean, it's not like we have stations up yet because I actually as Dennis is talking I have new thoughts that I would I don't know. I just I think thinking about it a little bit more might might be good to do. Yeah. 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 Okay. Uh, so Jane, is there if, if we pull that piece out, does that impact anything in terms of the yeah. operations? Would that be cause any difficulty? Okay. okay. All right, good. And the the one other thing I'd throw yeah. on the into the mix is as a time of use customer who will take one for the team tonight in voting to increase my rates more than everybody else's. I pay, what do I pay overnight at my house, Jane? Seven, six cents? You're incredible, yes. So overnight. Yeah, so Jane has just disclosed my family's personal electricity use <laughs> um, with a breakdown of what items we use uh, overnight. Um, but the car is the, is the main one. So. I pay six, seven, six or seven cents overnight to charge my car, and it's great. Thank you very much for the time you use rate, everybody. Um, I would never use this because I'm not going to go, unless I had to, I'm not going to pay 11 cents at my job because I just, if I can make it home, which I can, I wouldn't pay that much. I'd go wait till the night, and I'd pay six cents overnight. So whatever it is, seven. 
Um, so that's just one other thing to think about. When we map what our charges are, we should think about how that will actually work. What are people's options? And the only other thing is there's a company called ChargePoint and others who operate, and I don't know how they do it. I mean, uh, they're obviously using the local electric company, and yet I'm paying ChargePoint when I'm at a charge point station. So how does that actually work? Because they're not allowed to resell electricity. Well, th they are as long as they're not in a municipal utility service territory. Oh, okay. And I see. Yeah, you know, because they can be a licensed retail seller of electricity. And there's no deal we can strike with a company like that, like that we're the ones selling the electricity, because if you're in the charge point network, then you show up on their app. And that means you bring in a whole other possible sheaf of I mean, huge numbers of customers that will know that you're there. You know? How do analog, uh, our equipment at Analog is a charge point station. Okay. So we, they swipe the card, it goes through charge point, and then we get the revenue from charge Okay, point. so we're doing that now. So Correct. is that what we're contemplating doing here as well? Most, most likely. Okay. Yeah. So it will be part of. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Then. Yeah, because all the ones that yeah. I see downtown are. Charge point okay. Stations. Then yeah. I didn't know that that that's how this was going to work. And and it really, it, in in a sense, what you're selling is is a convenience and a service rather rather than a commodity, because people have have the ability to do it at home for much less. But if you're at if you're at work, you can't you know, right. drive and home you, and charge your and car. And if you have to drive 150 miles after work or something, right? right. Yeah. All right, I get it a little bit better now. This is a information. little bit of a convenience Research premium. Research charge point. Yep. It's a privately owned company yep. with close to, I believe, uh, $500 million in venture capitalists Ooh. behind wow. it. So what are we paying charge point to yeah. do analog? What are they getting out of that? Uh, there's, a, there's a 10% fee that they charge us to process the payment. That's a lot. Mm. Too bad. They get 10% of the sale. And that's just to be use their name, like we're they're like white labeling. Basically, that's just to use the charge point name and be on their app. Well, no, it's it's for that as well as actually taking and processing the credit card payment that goes right through them, and then we get a received check for that. We could just disrupt that somehow. <laughs> anyway, sorry, I'm monopolizing this. It's just it's interesting, and it's going to be big. Problem. All right. Do we have any other questions or comments? Or? No, it's a good discussion. If, if not, I will entertain the motion. Somebody want to make the motion? Mr. Ovalo? Yes. To make the motion? Okay. All right. So, so the motion is that uh, the Board of Commissioners approved rates DPM, DPU numbers 269, 270, 271, 272, 273, 274, 275, and 276. Effective July 1st, 2017, on the recommendation of general manager. That's a motion to be made. Yes. Do I have a second? Second. Then move to second it. Further discussion? I see none. All in favor, please raise your right hand. Opposed? That motion carries 4 0. Let the record reflect that. Great. And I think we're pretty much in agreement that we will hold off on the second on the second motion, defer that to a future a future meeting. That's that one right there? Okay. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Okay, very good. Thank you, Mayhew. Hill, just a quick question. Go ahead. Um, when we talk about that at the Citizen Advisory Board next week, who is sitting in on from you guys on the, that one? Only question is if it's Dave, then obviously he's bringing knowledge of electric cars. If it's okay, try to make it. Are you available? What is it? What is it? It's next uh, the twenty-first, which I believe is next Wednesday. I don't think I can, but uh, I can maybe phone in. I, was just curious. I don't know if anyone's going to have any questions. Cause I, I actually had my questions answered just now. And no, he's, I think, talking about <laughs> the CIBO. Yeah, was thinking more oh, I see. Yeah, I'm so sorry. I apologize. And, you know, again, I don't know if um, Jason or someone may have experience with it um, on our board that he may have some. But I just, you know, it was interesting to get your your perspective at all um, being a. Yeah, if, if I could, I would. And um, I'm happy to call in, too. Um, I might be out of town. Yeah, okay. Not a problem. Thanks. Why don't we do that? Why don't you make it a point to call in then? Okay. The meeting's what, 6.30? Yeah. Yeah, because I had planned to come to that, cover that meeting uh, next next uh, Friday, Wednesday. And may, maybe no one will have any questions. I just, right. like I said, I, I picked up a lot by right. 
the time of use discussion from your point of view and the electric car charging station. So, okay. so Phil, are you planning on going? This I was planning on going next Wednesday. Does it make sense to go? What? Oh, I mean, hey, the more the merrier. We all no, want to show. We all want to show up. We can all show up. <laughs> no, I'm just thinking in case Dave's uh, no, if Dave's, not able to. Yeah, it's, it, I certainly. But you know, they're looking for somebody who has personal electrical vehicle knowledge. I don't have an electrical vehicle or a hybrid, yeah. but, it's, which, but it's going, that's going to be my next car, i got to yeah. be honest with you. But that's <laughs> not the only Tesla. generator. Right. right. So. I, they also want to discuss some other things with the, with the CAD. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so. Okay. okay. All right, very good. Jane, sure. come forward. Thank you. I'm here to report on uh, April and May purchase power. Uh, so we've created a few slides here to look at the first quarter, and we've compared 2016 to 2017. So this first chart looks at the kilowatt hour sales for the first quarter. Um, and as you can see for the quarter, um, in 2017, we have about 216 um, million kilowatt hours compared to 210. That was in 2016. So this is up about 2.88%, a little less than 3%. Um, however, when you look at the full fiscal year, we're considerably um, flat. We're less than 1%. It's 0.6% higher um, in 17 um, than 16, and that's with May and June estimated right now. Um, so it was um, a productive quarter. Um, this next slide looks at the revenue received from the purchase power capacity and transmission. Um, and if we look at total revenue for the quarter, um, 2016 to 2017, um, it's about uh, 500,000 less in 2017 than 2016. Um, two contributing factors of, uh, are related to this. Um, in, in 2016, our sales were down about 2.6%. Um, so we had to recover more dollars over less uh, kilowatt hours. In 2017, um, as I mentioned before, we're relatively flat. We're up about 1%. Um, in addition, in 2016, our revenue initially in the beginning of the year was less than our expenses. Um, so what we try to do in the fiscal year is recover our full uh, purchase power capacity costs. Um, and so those get updated monthly. So there was a uh, necessity to increase our uh, PPCT in the third quarter because of that um, situation. In 2017, uh, our revenues were exceeding our expenses, so that would allow us to decrease it. In the, in the third quarter as opposed to uh, overall. Um, overall, uh, the ca capacity and transmission expenses from 2016 to 17 increased about 5.6% or $1.7 million. So it doesn't really show it in this quarter, um, but overall there was an increase in those uh, revenues based on the fiscal year. Um, this next slide looks at the capacity, transmission, and fuel. Uh, again, January through April 2016 is the first bar, um, and 2017 is the darker, darker shaped bar. Um, and this is just uh, reflective of, of, of our expenses. Um, um, now that we have quite a bit of hydro projects within our portfolio, we thought it would be interested to look at precipitation and how that relates to the hydro projects. Um, so this first chart looks at the precipitation by inches um, for the first quarter, 2016 versus 2017. Um, the highlights of this is that uh, in January and April in 2017, we had considerably higher precipitation uh, than we did in 2016. Overall, uh, for, the, for the quarter, the average was 3.3 um, inches uh, compared to 2.6 inches. Um, so that was good for our hydro projects, as we'll see in the next couple slides. This looks at the production. Uh, the blue graphs represent the 2016 figures, and the uh, purple represent 2017. And similar to the last uh, slide, January and April, um, the productions were up for those hydro projects that we have purchased power agreements with. And then we just kind of try to look at these uh, precipitation levels and their effect on the energy product uh, related to the hydros and the spot market. Um, hydros really don't 
dictate the spot market. They're, they're, they're kind of run a river. Uh, natural gas is really what the commodity is that dictates the spot market. However, the more hydro that we have, the less we have to buy in the spot market. So that's, that's a good thing. Um, and these projects have been very beneficial to us uh, within our portfolio. So that one is the 2016 number. And then this one looks at the 2017. And as, and as we, we talked about, January uh, and April had considerably higher precipitation, um, thus higher hydro production uh, in 2017 than it did um, in the previous year. And that concludes my report, Mr. Chairman. Now? Thank you. Thank you. Wendy, you're up next. Okay, good evening. Um, reporting on April 2017 financials. And the first thing we want to take a look at is accounts receivable. We're running about 82% in FY17, 82% uh, current. And when you look at 30 to 69, uh, 30 to 90 days, it's about another 15%. And only 3% over 90 days uh, is outstanding. So that's pretty fantastic. And if you compare that to FY16, there were 89% current, 9% 30 to 90 days, and only 2% over 90 days and we've improved greatly since FY15 where we had 75% current, 20% 30 to 90 days and 5% over 90. So uh, I think we're on the right track. We had uh, two moratorium, how did you phrase that? I'm sorry. Okay, the moratorium ended in April. Okay, and ended in April and we had two big pushes. So we should see uh, some of those effects either in May or June, depends on the timing of that. Phil, can I ask a question? Sure, go ahead. Is that uh, commercial, residential, all types of yes, customers? It's all, all yes, mixed it is. In? All, it's a, our complete accounts receivable aging. And, and is there a difference usually on who's further out? Is it usually the commercial industrial customers? It's not? No. We have the ability to shut off some commercials okay. for non-payment. Um, and there's a moratorium for residential right. from November through April. Okay. So it tends to be more residential. It's usually residential. Yes. Right. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Okay. So then we're going to look at our base revenue. Come on, got to get this guy. Uh, our base revenue as compared to our operating expenses. So in FY17, uh, year to date so far, we're looking at $21,660,000 in base revenue compared to FY16 of $19,702,000, which is approximately about a 10% increase. Um, and that actually, that compares to the budget of 21,250,000, so it's slightly uh, above budget, about 1.6% um, more than anticipated. So we're looking pretty good there. And the base revenue compared to our operating expenses is pretty much right on target with a 10% increase as well. Uh, FY17 actual, um, I'm, I'm sorry, FY17, yes, year to date, 17,538,000 as compared to FY16 of 15, million nine hundred and fifteen thousand and then when you compare that to the budget we're about 1.4 percent less than anticipated at about seventeen million eight hundred and thirty seven so uh, overall we're right on target uh, budget wise and uh, increasing our base revenue to our operating is, is pretty much straight on okay so then as Jane just went over, uh, the PPCT revenue is about $28.2 million compared to the expense of $26.8 million. Um, and the fuel revenue, $27.7 million compared to fuel expense of 27.4. So um, as she mentioned, the pass-through of $1.7 million excess in revenue will actually bring our true net income to about uh, $4 million. And uh, as that compares to last year, $3.6 million, Again, it's about a 10% increase, um, and as far as the budget, the overall budget, we're looking at about an 18% increase right now. We have to remember that at, with year end, there are a lot of adjustments that come on the books that are not reflected uh, through each month, so the timing of that really, really matters. So um, we actually, uh, speaking of which, we had our auditors in-house yesterday, and they um, 
They did some preliminary testing. They were supposed to be here again today, uh, but they didn't need to be. So that's a good sign mm -hmm. that we're, we're right on target where we need to be. And then if you look at the overall, I, I just like to show you the overall expenses, uh, the operating expenses, and where they compare um, month to month, ver uh, FY17 to FY16, and how it compares to the budget. And it tells exactly the story that I just uh, mentioned. Any questions in relation to that? Questions or comments from anybody? And of course, you have the financials in front of you as well. Right. If you, yeah. you know. Very good. That's good. Thank you, Wendy. Okay. okay. Thank you, Wendy. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Wendy. Reed, I think you're up again. He's back. sets of glasses. <laughs> right. <laughs> Come on, you're not that old. Thank you. I'm glad to report the month of uh, March and April 2017. The first page you see the capital improvement projects, the list of them. For the month of March, we spent uh, approximately 40644 uh, the, the, for on the last item of for the LEDs. <clears throat> but the total year to date, do total for both months, uh, that shows for every uh, category of the projects. The next slide, uh, if you go, that's a routine construction that shows the year to date spending. The total for the month of March and April is $1,606,613. Uh, so that's year to date for, uh, for those months. Uh, but overall, we, for the FY17, we budgeted $9.5 million, which so far we've spent approximately $5.8 million. So the balance remaining is 3.7, which as you could see for the month of June and July, uh, June for the month of June, um, that we're going to report the next month, you're going to see approximately, you know, that we're going to catch up. Because we got a project, the DG project that we're going to have to pay, and that's going to bring it up to approximately 9.5, 9.6 million maybe. <coughs> the next page shows the routine maintenance. Those are seven plans that you know we um, implemented. Basically, we are on target. We're making good progress on those, all of those. I'm not going to go over single uh, one by one, but I'm glad to report that you know we're making good progress on those. <clears throat> especially for the pole inspections, the transformer replacements, uh, and also the substation maintenance. We found uh, no problems, uh, the hot spots, that every month we check the industrial parks as well as the substations, and no problems were found in any of those. <clears throat> the next slide, I guess it's going to show you the double poles or the poles, the ownership and the custodial. We've been over this many times. I'm sure by now the people, they memorize that and they, uh, they know exa is exactly what the difference is in between the custodial and the ownership. Ownership is 50-50 between us and Verizon. Custodial is uh, Reading. We split be between R RMLD and uh, Verizon, and North Reading is RMLD. The other two towns, Linfield and Wilmington, is a Verizon's responsibility. <coughs> the next slide shows you the engines report. Basically, the ball in court. <coughs> so you see that pretty much, you know, again, we're making good progress on those. Uh, in, the mo in the town of North Reading, we got about 107 pole bots that he has to be re re pulled out of the ground. That shows that, you know, the progress being made by doing the transfers, and everybody has transferred. And now we're going to have to uh, remove those that they, the guys are making progress on those. So <coughs> I'm happy to see that. Again, this is, these numbers, they go up and down there because we have lots and lots of construction going on throughout all those four communities. As we're making these upgrades, you're going to see these numbers going up, the double poles. But uh, we get to them and we prioritize them and we uh, do the transfers. And if uh, Verizon and Comcast, they do the transfers, usually we are right after them pulling the uh, pole butts out of the ground. <coughs> so. 
that uh, shows the devil pole conditions. And then the next slide, it shows the reliability indices, SADI, KD, and SAFI, which basically tells you about the health and well-being of the system. Uh, our reliability is good uh, in all categories. We are well below national and regional average. And these uh, numbers, the, 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 the benchmarkings, they're set by APPA. Uh, that everybody reports to those numbers and then they tell us what has been the numbers in our region and compared to national where we are. So we're doing very well on those. <coughs> the next slide uh, uh, shows you the outage causes. As you could see on the right, uh, you see the annual average from 2012 to 2017, which majority of the outages were caused by equipment, trees, and wildlife. And the chart on the left, the pie chart, shows the, the 2017 year to date, to April, uh, that where we are with those. So this year we had a couple of storms that made, brought trees down. And, you know, uh, these are the, unfortunately, you know, mm, there's nothing we can do with these uh, pine trees and shallows to pine trees, tall trees that they come down and they make extensive damage uh, to the lines. So. But uh, we are pay on those, we are also making good progress. The equipment, as you could see from the right to the left, you know, <coughs> that shrinking down, we started showing some of the maintenance programs that we have implemented. So we started showing that you know, the, we, we are in the right direction. So that concludes my report. If you have any questions, I'll be more than happy to answer the question. Questions, <coughs> Good. Good. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good. Thank you. Okay. General discussions. Our next meeting is July the 20th, and we're looking to schedule a strategic meeting. The CAB meeting is next uh, Wednesday, and I agreed to cover that. A um, couple things. Um, since I'm signing the payroll, I'm, uh, I'm the secretary for this month. Not the payroll, the uh, warrant. I'm the secretary for this month. Um, I don't think, do we, we got a lot of minutes to approve at some point? So that we all next month. Yeah, yeah. I think it's been a, a little while since yeah, I've actually they're, remember seeing they're it. Ready to go. They're just sitting in the yard. Okay, we can get them on the meeting. My last question: Do we have the big fire that was here in Reading? Were we involved in anything on that, on the, the, the schoolhouse fire, that, on the condos there? Um, I'd have to check the code report. I mean, we responded, but I don't know if we had any record of issues. But okay. Just to double check. I don't know. No, I just wondered what, what if we had a role, what our role was in that case. Living in a condo myself, when I heard that, I got a little concerned, to be honest with you. <laughs> Typically, if there's a fire or something, we'll, we'll, the fire department will respond and we pull meters okay. so that they, they de-energize. I, I don't know for sure, but I, I thought there were some issues um, with respect to the, uh, the sprinkler system, whether or not it was. Well, I understand. What I've heard is that in that building there's an attic, and that's where the fire got in that attic, and just is very hard, difficult to get to in the attic. I mean, Dave, well, you may know better because you it was two right doors there. down from my house. Yeah. Oh, oh, really? But I don't know the construction details. But yeah, it was quite quite a scene. Yeah, yeah. yeah. you must have felt it. And yeah, we were there. Okay, it's tough. Yeah, All it's right. tough for the uh, residents. Yeah. Very Do you have anything else for regular session? Any other discussion? If not, I'll entertain a motion to go into executive session. Mr. Oliver. Motion. You want to read the motion, please? I'll be happy to. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, move that the board go into executive session to conduct business in relation to other entities making, selling, and distributing electrical power to consider the purchase of real property and to discuss the strategy with respect to collective bargaining and then to return to regular session for the sole purpose of adjournment. Okay. That's been moved to seconded. Second. Okay. Uh, Pull the board, Mr. Hennessy. Mr. Hennessy, aye. Mr. Bassino, aye. Mr. O'Rourke, Rourke, aye. Mr. Aye. We move into executive session down the hall. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Phil. Good seeing you, Dennis. Thank you, Dennis. Tracy, do you want to take a? If you can bring your eye. Is educational. Yeah. Well, as always. As always. Okay. See you. Do you want me to grab Dennis's too or leave that here?